good to be here again at the MacArthur Center for Expository Preaching. Dr. Thomas Schreiner, the James Harrison Buchanan uh, Professor of New Testament Interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's out here teaching in our Doctor of Ministry program, and we're grateful for your time with our students and to take a little time to help the MacArthur Center uh, in its work on encouraging and, and promoting expository preaching. So thank you again for being with us. Well, it's great to be here. Well. What I'd like to do now is is hone in a bit on your expertise as a New Testament scholar and uh, the work you've done in theology as well, and think about how that uh, relates to uh, those who you're often ministering to, which is pastors in their studies. So let's begin by talking about biblical theology. Uh, some of our audience, uh, that may be a, a popular buzzword for them. Uh, some may be newer to biblical theology, may be more familiar with the uh, concept of systematic theology. Talk about how biblical theology, let's do what biblical theology is in your understanding and how it's a benefit to an expositor. Yeah, I, I think the best way in a short compass to talk about biblical theology is to talk about the story of the Bible. There, there's a story, there's a narrative, there's a plot. And, and biblical theology, in, in one sense, is, is not difficult. What's that story? We're, we're trying to see what is the unfolding story as, as we read the Bible. What, why is that helpful? It's, it's helpful because wherever you're preaching, where are we in the story? Right? We're not, just to give an example, we're not in Leviticus. So if you're preaching Leviticus, you can't, you can't preach, well, you shouldn't preach, I should say, that we ought to offer sacrifices, right? It's part of the story that atonement is needed. Human beings are sinners. That's part of the story. But we have to look at the whole story, and the sacrifices for sin come, obviously, in the sacrifice of Christ. So, biblical theology helps. It's not absolutely separated from systematic theology, but it helps us see how the whole story fits together. And we always ought to be thinking, where are we, another way to put it is, where are we in terms of the covenants? Are we, are we in, the, in the storyline? Are you in the old covenant with Moses, the Davidic covenant with David, or are we in the new covenant with Christ? That is where you're reading in the Bible. Obviously, as believers, we live in the new covenant. But we always have to take into account where we are in the story when we're preaching. And that is absolutely vital. It sounds simple. But in a some lot way, of people don't do it. <laughs> sure, in some way it's context, Yes, but a larger context. Exactly. And you're asking the preacher to be mindful of not only where this is in God's unfolding story, but where his audience is as well. Right, right. So, you know, I mean, if I could just give an example. Jesus talks about in Matthew 5, if your brother or sister is offended with you, uh, reconcile with them before you bring your gift to the altar. But Jesus was speaking in a particular context. We don't have altars today. Jesus was speaking in a time in which there was a temple. So that's, that's pretty easy to understand. But we, we, but we recognize Jesus ministered in a particular time in redemptive history where Israel still lived under the Old Covenant. And his illustrations and stories and applications fit with that particular story. So there's obvious benefit to the preacher and to the interpreter in thinking about how this fits in God's big story. Uh, are there concerns you have with biblical theology and the preacher, um, either maybe in a case like an N.T. Wright kind of a case where the story is angled a little differently than you would, you would put it, or can someone put too much emphasis on that, the overarching story, and miss what's happening in the text? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a, absolutely true. Two concerns. One, even Wright says this about himself. He's a big thinker, which is a plus. But the danger is that that overarching story, you may impose it right. upon the text. Right. And, and, I th and I think the second concern is similar the, the story may so dominate one's thinking that the particulars of the text get squelched as well. So that, you know, some people who preach, they'll say redemptive historically, they actually don't believe in applying the text. Uh, they, they just think it's enough to tell the story of what God has done in Christ, 
And at least I don't think that's that's a good way to preach. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we we have to tell the story, but in accord with what the text is saying and apply it. Yeah. As part of that, the interpretation that comes along with biblical theology, there's a lot of different angles in that story, a lot of different emphases that you can make where a text will keep you in line with what it is saying yeah. rather than imposing that in. Exactly. Yeah, the text the text is finally our authority and texts I, I like to say texts are stubborn things. Mm. You know, they're, they they sit there in all their beauty and they they remind us don't ignore me. And uh, here's what I'm saying and 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 we can, we all fall short of that sometimes. Yeah. And so when we prioritize the text, uh, that can be a safeguard in employing biblical theology and preaching. Yes, yes. You, we really need both. Yeah. Because you, you could look very carefully at a text in the Old Testament, but if you're not thinking of redemptive history, if you're not thinking of biblical theology, you could apply that in really terrible ways. Good. Let's think about some of these stubborn texts. Uh, specifically some that you have worked on for uh, so much of your career, and we're grateful for that work. Uh, let's start with the book of Romans. Uh, how about some help for a preacher who's considering tackling Romans? What would your concerns be uh, that he would have sorted before he dives in? Uh, what do you think about when you think about advice for a man about to start uh, an exposition of the gospel of God? Mm, mm. Well, it helps, of course, it, it, it helps already to have some kind of theology going on in your, in your heart and mind. You're, you're, you're already developed to some extent theologically. I think that's true of every book. Sure. You're not, you're not coming to any book of the New Testament or the Old Testament without context. But I, I would say one of the dangers of Romans is for people to think, this is this is the whole of Paul's theology. And I, I think that's clearly not true. We have we have to remember that Romans is probably the most complete exposition of Paul's theology, but don't don't think it's the whole. It's it's absolutely fundamental, but it's not the whole. And then recognize do recognize that the issues that come up in Romans have to do especially with Jews and Gentiles. So it's it's the law, and 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 sin, uh, you know, the law plays such a huge role in justification. The 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 role of Israel, the role of unclean foods. So if we think more cosmically about Romans, there were there were Jewish and Gentile divisions. I think in Rome. So I think it's helpful to think Paul wrote this for a practical pastoral reason to explain his theology, not all of it, but a lot of it, to to unify Jews and Gentiles in Rome. He wants the church to be harmonized. So when we think of Romans, we ought to think, this book is practical. This book was meant to bring unity to believers. And thirdly, I think he wanted the Roman churches to support his mission to Spain. But they wouldn't support his mission to Spain if they weren't with him theologically. So, the, you know, I, I, I think it's helpful to think Romans is pastoral, Romans is missional, Romans is theological, all three. Very helpful. Let's do the same thing with 1 Corinthians, maybe the book you've spent the most time on, it sounds like, in your teaching career. And I think you have, from my understanding, the entire New Testament memorized. But you apparently have a, a good grasp of 1 Corinthians through all these years. Do the same thing with 1 Corinthians. Help a, a guy who's uh, starting out. There's things that he needs to have sorted uh, as he approaches the text. Uh, what, what are you concerned about with 1 Corinthians? Yeah, I, I think it's helpful to think of 1 Corinthians. Paul's, the pa Paul's a pastor, pastor, missionary, theologian. And it's, it's a great book. It's a kind of a case study book almost. Here's all these problems in the churches, divisions, incest, sexual sin, uh, food offered to idols, spiritual gifts. So I think it's helpful for us to think, what's Paul the pastor doing? How does he, how does he tackle those problems? What's his, what's his theology? What's his worldview? And then that can inform us. What do, what do I do when there's divisions? 
How do I handle church discipline, sexual sin? And uh, there's a depth and profundity which hopefully feeds into us so that we, when we face pastoral problems, that we don't just say to people, stop it. Don't do that. Don't be divided. Don't commit incest. Of course, that's true. But that's not, that's not helpful, right? It's like counseling a person. They come into you for counseling. If they're struggling with sin, you, we can say stop it. And at some point, we do need to say that. But it's, it's richer and deeper than that. There's a theological foundation. So we want to see that theological foundation that Paul builds to get to the practical application. That's what, that's what we do every week when we preach. So in a way, we see Paul as the preacher in this book. He, he lays out his theology and then he applies it. So what a great model for us. Very helpful. Uh, let's get into one that's uh, trickiest of all, potentially. Let's talk about Hebrews. I'm grateful for your commentary on Hebrews. My copy has been almost completely chewed up by me uh, over the years. Uh, because it's not an easy book to interpret. Um, talk about how to approach preaching the book of Hebrews. What should uh, a man have in his mind as he approaches it? Big picture and then some, some help that you'd have for him. Yeah, yeah. Hebrews is tough. So one of the things, I just taught Hebrews last semester and I said to the students, one of the things that makes Hebrews tough is the readers are tempted to go back to the sacrificial system. How many of you have ever faced a situation where someone was tempted to do that. Never. Yeah. It's impossible. There's not even a sacrificial system out there. So, it, 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 from the outset, it almost seems disconnected from our real lives. So, I think it's helpful to think of Hebrews this way. First, chapter 13, verse 21, 22, it's a sermon. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we tend to think of, oh, Hebrews, it's just deep theology, and it is, but it's a sermon. It's, he's, he's preaching to these people. And what's the main point of the sermon? I would argue the main point of the sermon comes in the warning passages. Don't fall away. Here's another way to think of Hebrews. So I I want people to see the big picture. Five warning passages. So 2, 1 through 4, 3, 7 through 4, 13, 5, 11 through 6, 12, 10, 26 through 31. I mean, some people would divide that differently. 12, 25 through 29. Five times he circles back to the warnings. That's what he's about. So he does theology, and then he hits them with the warning, right? Theology, and he hits them with the warning. Boom, 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 boom. So I like to think of the warnings are like a kaleidoscope. You know, you shake it, but it's, it's the same message. It's just different angles. So when we read those warning passages, we ought not to play them off against each other. He's doing the same thing every time. Like, this is a sermon with one main point. Don't fall away. Why do I say that? Because people say, oh, Hebrews is so hard. It's so complex. Yes, there are hard things in it, but let's remember the main message is clear. Then I want to say about the theology. Actually, the theology is clear too, and he actually does the same thing. What is the theology of the book? Jesus is better. Notice that word better in the book. Jesus is better than the angels, chapters 1 and 2, who mediated the, the Mosaic law. Chapters 3 and 4, Jesus is better than uh, Moses and Joshua. Chapters 5 through 10, Jesus is the better priest. He's, he's better than the Aaronic priest. He's the better Melchizedekian priest. So, those are, those are big, big categories, right? Jesus is better than angels. Jesus is better than Moses and Joshua. Jesus is better than the Levitical Aaronic priesthood. Because of that, don't fall away. Don't go back. Two other things I want to say. Just when we get to chapter 7 and 10, that's really heavy theology. So, how can we think of it big picture, simply? And I would say, chapter 7, he's the better priest. Chapter 8, better covenant. Chapters 9 and 10, better sacrifice. So, again, I want, I want people to think, what's, what's going on in this book as a whole? Better priest, better covenant. Better sacrifice. Therefore, don't fall away. A couple more things I want to say. What is chapter 11 doing in that book? The Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith. That's another way of saying don't fall away. Mm 
So it all integrates together. There's a simplicity in the book. What does it mean not to fall away? It means you trust God. That's what it means. You put your faith in him. So he's not really doing something different in that chapter. So think of him as a preacher. He's, in a way, he's maybe the clearest preacher in the New Testament. I mean, all of God's word is clear, so I don't want to press that too far. But what you're saying is that Hebrews, if it is the earliest extant Christian sermon that we have, it teaches us something about preaching. It does. It's remarkable. It's deeply theological, but in, in one way, it's so clear. It's just we're distant. We don't think in terms of tabernacle, temple, sacrifice. One other practical application, you know, we're not tempted to go back to you know, sacrifices, but I think the readers, Barnabas Linders says this in his book in Hebrews, the reader, why did they want to go back to these sacrifices? I think they had a problem with guilt. And Hebrews really emphasizes our, our, our sins are washed away, you're clean, your conscience is cleansed, you can boldly enter God's presence. I mean, it's such a huge problem in all of our lives is the guilt of what we've done. So Hebrews is a great book for preaching and, and for counseling. You know, so it was, we, we've committed grievous sins, and Hebrews says, you're clean. Yeah. You're forgiven. You think, and I know you're, you're going to like this, but so many approach Hebrews wanting to focus on how this can reconcile with their understanding of biblical perseverance and try to solve a theological problem by isolating chapter 6 and chapter 10. Your view of Hebrews is that God intends to use warning passages, if I'm summarizing it accurately, as a means of persevering his people. Uh, talk about how that should help a preacher see what his responsibility is, as his people aren't thinking of returning to a, a sacrificial system, but could be looking over their shoulder considering a former manner of life. or do consider the, the difficulty of dealing with their guilt. How do we preach like whoever that preacher was? Yeah, yeah, uh, so, so practical, right? We're not, we're not tempted to return to Judaism, but we may, we may want to go back to our secular life or some other ideology or some other religion. I mean, we think of people who come out of Islam or whatever mm -hmm. you come out of. So Hebrews is so practical because the author is saying, don't go back there. And the warnings, as you said, the warnings are the means God uses to keep us. So it's, right, if, if, this, if this water I had here were poison, and I say, don't drink it, that's the sort of thing Hebrews is doing. The Hebrews is saying, don't drink the poison. Don't go back. Recognize, recognize this will destroy you. Here's a simple illustration I used a couple of years ago. I stood above the Grand Canyon, and I thought to myself, it'd be fun to jump. <laughs> Strange thought. But, you know, a warning went off in my head. It'll kill you. Yeah. <laughs> it would be fun to jump for a little while. Less fun to land. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's kind of what warning, warn, warn, uh, Hebrews is doing, right? D don't jump. It'll, it'll destroy you. So you see that pastoral heart. You're really forgiven in Christ. Don't forsake what Jeremiah says, right? The fountain of living water for broken cisterns that hold no water. That's, that's what Hebrews is about. Okay, that's helpful. So one of the things you've encouraged us in class is to be thinking about preaching larger sections. And I think what you just did in those three books is show us uh, that it's important to hang on to the large themes that are there, the theology of the book, that's probably one of the things that will help you grab onto bigger sections. Talk a little bit about that concern. Uh, maybe somebody getting caught in a worm's eye view uh, of a text rather than making sure that they're uh, grabbing the whole piece. H give advice about pericopes and yeah. sections and preaching bigger chunks, smaller chunks. What's your, what's your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's been a tradition in evangelicalism. Some of the greatest preachers spend five, ten years on a particular book. We have to remember they're excellent preachers, and that they're the exception. Not, and I don't think that's a pattern most of us should follow. I think we we need to preach bigger chunks for for a couple of reasons. One, people lose track. 
Yeah. What's what's this book about? Uh, it, it, it's hard to follow a, a line of thought in a book if you're in it for five or ten years. Yeah. Secondly, so many people in our churches, we need to recognize the only teaching they hear Sunday morning. So if you spend ten years in Romans, what a great book, but there's a lot of the rest of the Bible that they, they don't hear. So I recommend preaching bigger chunks. There's time to do smaller portions. And I actually recommend, not as a rigid rule, but do a New Testament book and then an Old Testament book. When you do an Old Testament book, do it faster. So if I were to preach Hebrews, which I didn't do, actually, I was going to do it near the end, but I didn't get to it. But I thought about it, I'd probably preach chapters 1 through 7 as one sermon. Mm -hmm. Chapters 8 through 10 as the second. Maybe 11 through 15 as the third. And then maybe I'd take four or five sermons for the rest of the book. Because sometimes we feel like, well, what I do with Romans is what I got to do with Leviticus. But thats I don't think that's true. And I think the thought of spending 38 weeks in Leviticus scares us off. Yeah. We think, well, my, that's not going to work well. Well, we, we ought to be more creative and I th- think faithful to say, no, I don't have to spend the same amount of time in Leviticus that I do in Romans. Yeah. The, the books are different. and And that would free us up to say, yeah, we can... We can do numbers, and uh, we can do Isaiah. Isaiah is a deep, rich book, but you could be in Isaiah for 30 years. Sure. You don't want to do that. Right. Yeah, no, I think it's helpful. We tell the guys in seminary, uh, you know, Dr. MacArthur has, uh, he's preached five sermons on the word Paul before, so, or maybe eight. Uh, and so I just like to helpfully remind them, you're no MacArthur. No. So I, I think that's what, what we're saying. There's, there's a place for both. Uh, don't get trapped into uh, a tiny kind of exposition stuck here. Uh, that may not be what your giftedness is, and no. don't miss the larger forest. I think so. I mean, John Piper's done this with Romans, Martin Lloyd Jones, but they are not the model for all of us in everything they did. It's helpful. As great as they are. And Absolutely. Were. Let's talk about a little bit more about preaching. Uh, when you think about your the worst sermons you've ever heard, uh, your pet peeves about preaching, uh, what are you most concerned about? The top things that come to your mind when you think the worst sermons I've ever heard. Yeah, my top concern is obviously the person didn't study the text. Yeah. We we all have different gifts in terms of presentation, and I I understand that we're all at different places. There in terms of giftedness. But if a person comes in the text, to, the, to the text and hasn't studied it and they haven't prepared well, that, that's annoying. And I, honestly, I think it's dishonoring to God. Hmm. Unless they have a great reason, and perhaps sometimes there is a great reason, some crisis in their family or something. But typically, there's not a good reason for, for not knowing what the text means. So that, that is clearly the most annoying thing. Secondly, the, the, the second biggest problem is just explaining the text without applying it. Hmm. Just doing a commentary. A data dump. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I love the Bible, but I do go hear sermons where I already know what's there, and I hear sermons and I think, I need the Bible applied to my life, just like everybody else. And I think, well, I already knew everything that was said there. I need to be reminded of that, but what does it mean to me? Yeah. Now, we, people have various gifts in terms of application, but at least try to apply it. Hmm. And sometimes people don't apply it at all. They think it's sufficient simply to explain what the text says. I don't think that's a good model of preaching. Application is necessary in preaching. And it is necessary. Exhortation. It's, it's the hardest part. It's the hardest part for me. Yeah. And um, I, I recognize it's a weakness I have, and I, I struggle, but at least, I, at least I try to apply it. So those are your, your top concerns. The worst sermons you've ever heard are uh, data dumps that have no application or they're not honoring the text. Mm. What about the best sermons you hear? Uh, what's, what do you love in uh, – what do you love about preaching? Uh, what sets your heart on fire? What – What's your great encouragement when you think about preaching? What, what, what makes a sermon great? Yeah, I, it, it's almost, it's really the reverse. One, the, the, you know, show me wondrous things from your law, the psalmist says, and you see it. The preacher, uh, 
the preacher, different personalities, quiet personalities, extroverts, you see when they preach, they're excited about the text and they've learned from the text. It's clear. It comes out. And, uh, and you learn. Uh, even things you've known before, it strikes you in a new and fresh way. And they apply it in powerful ways. So I'm convicted or I'm encouraged or challenged. And, and you're, you sense God speaking. The Holy Spirit's speaking, not just to me, but everybody in this room. There's a sense of what's going on. And that's a great experience uh, when you're preaching and uh, when, you're, when you're listening. I, you know, I would say as a preacher, just, you know, there are times I've gone into the pulpit and thought, this sermon's going to be amazing. I feel like I'm depending on God. This is going to be amazing. And I step out and think, I, that didn't go well. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I thought it was going to be so great. but And then, and then I've had the opposite, opposite experience. I go in the pulpit. Maybe I pray harder. And I say, this is going to be awful. This was not good. And suddenly the Lord shows up. So there's that sovereignty of God in these, in when we preach, isn't there? It, where there are times where he takes over. And I, it's, it's, it's such a good reminder. Our, our work is pretty feeble in one way. I, I always feel, I mean, how, what, how can I do justice to this text? Especially, you know, you do Psalm 23. I'm like, what can I say about Psalm 23? <laughs> It's been it's such a great text. How, who is adequate for these things? Yeah. And the power is there. It's in the spirit of God moving through the word of God to the people of God. And yeah. that's where we we see that effect. Yeah, and that's that's so helpful because I think I think as preachers we begin to think somehow I can do this. Sure. And I think God God reminds us, no, the power's not in ourselves. The power's in his word. Yeah, we want to communicate as best we can. We want to be clear and precise, but we ultimately know that the work and the results are up to the working of his spirit. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Dr. Schreiner, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your ministry. It's been a benefit to, to me personally and to so many of us. Thanks for being with us at the MacArthur Center and at the Master's Seminary. Uh, we're really grateful uh, for your, your ministry to us.